Welcome to this webinar on selecting the appropriate modelling approach for integrated environmental systems assessment and management. I'm Serena Hamilton. My research focuses on the use of model-based approaches to understand and contribute to solving socio-environmental problems. Such problems transcend boundaries of disciplines, sectors and system components. In fact, the underlying causes of and solutions to environmental problems generally sit within social systems. It is also common for the problem to be interlinked to other environmental, social and or economic issues. To address socio-environmental problems, we need to be able to understand and explore the interactions between the different natural and human factors and processes. Integrated modelling allows such exploration and is therefore a useful and even necessary tool for studying socio-environmental systems. Modelling in general provides a systematic approach to organising data, knowledge and assumptions about a problem or system. Modelling of complex problems that cross disciplinary and sectorial boundaries requires integrated modelling which combines knowledge from two or more domains into one modelling framework. This type of modelling is apt for addressing socio-environmental problems which require integrating knowledge from domains such as ecology, hydrology, sociology, economics and psychology. Integrated modelling therefore provides a single platform to bring together and synthesise diverse knowledge, data, theories and perspectives. In this webinar we examine the model selection process. Modelling is often described in terms of four main phases. The first is defining and scoping the problem. Next is conceptualising the system, followed by formalising the model and finally applying it. The model selection phase sets a foundation of model formalisation. There are a large number of approaches that can be used to model socio-environmental systems, which can make the choice of approach a daunting task. Each approach has a different set of modelling features and technical requirements that makes it more suitable for some problems and contexts and less so for others. Model selection is a critical decision as it determines how the system and its processes, interactions and characteristics are described and represented in the model, as well as what data or skills are needed to build the model. Selecting the right approach is also important for ensuring that the model is adopted and used as intended by the end user. It is also important when modelling is used to enhance social learning, develop shared understanding among stakeholders or a joint commitment to action. In an earlier succinct video, Building the Basics Part 3, Choosing a Modelling Approach, Margaret Palmer explains how to choose the right modelling approach based on the modelling goal. In this webinar, we explore model selection in more detail. We outline a more formalised selection approach that considers the user, management and project context, as well as a broader range of selection criteria. I'll start with a little background on the topic. A 2013 paper by Rebecca Kelly and others focused on selecting among five common integrated modelling approaches, system dynamics, Bayesian networks, coupled component models, agent-based models and knowledge-based models. In that paper, a guiding framework in the form of a decision tree was proposed for selecting among these approaches. In the tree, the approaches were mapped out following a small set of criteria. For example, if the modelling goal is prediction and mainly quantitative data is available, then coupled component modelling, also known as hybrid modelling, is suggested as the most suitable approach. If both qualitative and quantitative data are available and the system processes are well understood, then knowledge-based models are considered suitable. But if the knowledge on the system processes is uncertain or incomplete, Bayesian networks are considered suitable. If the modelling goal is to enhance system understanding or social learning and the interest is primarily in individual interactions and their impact on the system, then agent-based models are suitable. But where dynamic processes and feedback loops are important and the aggregated effects of system behaviour and breadth of the system are of interest, then a systems dynamic modelling approach works best. Other decision paths and the relevant approach can be followed from this decision tree. Well, this tree provides a nice summary of some of the key features of the five approaches and their standard applications. It provides a rather limited view in terms of the approaches considered, 
their applications and the selection criteria. Additionally, since this was published, there have been a number of advances in the various approaches that allow non-standard applications. For example, there are dynamic Bayesian networks that allow temporarily dynamic relationships to be modelled. These are extensions to the standard Bayesian networks. Also, there have been applications of agent-based models, for example, that consider the interactions between systems elements at an aggregated level. Further, there are also many other approaches suitable for modelling socio-environmental systems that were not covered in the decision tree. Another shortcoming of the tree is that it starts with purpose, which assumes there is a clearly defined modelling goal. In reality, for complex socio-environmental problems, often the modelling purpose or purposes are not clearly defined or agreed upon. Rather, in many cases, at the beginning of the project, there is uncertainty about the modelling purpose from the end user side beyond the desire to improve understanding of the system or problem. In a 2018 paper on selecting tools for participatory modelling, Alexei Voinov and others identified two approaches for selecting methods that are applicable for integrated modelling. The first was the experience-driven approach, whereby the modeler's experience determines what to use. This is a less than ideal approach as there is a risk of the hammer and nail syndrome. The other approach involves more careful consideration of the technical and social factors involved, including stakeholder preferences and constraints. In the context of participatory modeling, involving the stakeholders in the selection of tools and methods and in the modeling co-design process is considered to both empower the stakeholder by leveling the playing field and improve the legitimacy of the modeling. The model selection process also draws on a recent paper with my colleagues in which we framed model selection in terms of usefulness, reliability and feasibility. We called this fitness for purpose. Usefulness is about addressing the needs of the end user, including their skills and capacities and consideration of how the model will be used. Reliability is about obtaining an adequate level of certainty and trust in the model given the problem context. This considers how well the system and its processes are understood as well as the nature of the problem. Feasibility is about whether the model can be developed given the practical constraints of the project, including data, time and expertise available. This fit for purpose framework is described in more detail in an IONS webinar called Design for Impact, a holistic approach to model development and evaluation. This leads us to the model selection process. Model selection itself is a multi-criteria decision-making problem that is influenced by a myriad of interactive factors, including technical factors, such as model structure, scale, and level of uncertainty allowed. It is also influenced by subjective factors, such as biases and the modeler's knowledge and experience about methods, and by social factors, such as stakeholders' acceptability of methods. We use a multi-criteria decision analysis process to structure the assessment and selection of the modelling approach. Being a multi-criteria problem, there is no single approach that can be deemed the best for any particular situation. In fact, many trade-offs are usually considered while choosing an approach, and therefore the aim is to find a satisfying approach that meets criteria selected and prioritised by the modeler or team. While model selection is typically carried out by the modeler, we strongly advocate that stakeholders, particularly the targeted end users, be involved in establishing the criteria and making the final decision. There are four main steps in the model selection that take you from a focus on the problem at hand all the way to evaluating the model. The first step is about establishing the modelling requirements and constraints. This includes the perceived modelling purpose, end user needs, and the management or research question. Broad goals could include prediction, exploration, optimization, and envisioning. However, as I mentioned earlier, the model purpose may not be clear at the beginning. So the purpose needs to be revisited and iteratively refined throughout the selection process. When considering the end user needs, we also need to ask questions such as, who will be using the model? When considering the question to be addressed, we ask, how will they be using the model? and what model features are critical to this. 
Let's now explore some of the dimensions related to model usability or fit for purpose that we mentioned a few minutes ago. Input accessibility should be considered. That is, how easy it is for the target end user to run the model, including the effort needed to pre-process data as model input. Similarly, output accessibility is important. Can the model results be understood and interpreted by the end user? Ease of maintenance and reusability or other end user requirements also require consideration. For example, the end user may require certain types of data or models be used or that certain management options be tested. Then we want to understand the problem context. What are the critical system or problem characteristics? What scales are important? What level of uncertainty is acceptable? And can the model uncertainty be reduced? Examples of other requirements related to the problem context may pertain to the representation of the overall system. For example, is it more important to examine the interactions between individuals and their impact on the system or to examine the aggregated effects? Fidelity, which describes how well the model represents the real world is another example, as is how well the key features of the system or problem are represented. For example, feedback loops, interactions, variables or factors like key components or external drivers. Or perhaps it is important to consider representation of uncertainty, including the magnitude of interactions or in the model structure or how temporal and spatial scales are treated. So all of these need to be carefully considered for the model to be reliable. The practical constraints are more straightforward to identify. This includes identifying the data and knowledge accessible, the time constraints and skills required. But constraints may also include the type and data available. Are they limiting? Human resources available can also be a factor in selecting the modeling approach, as can the math and coding skills within the team. Facilitation or other skills may be more important for participatory modeling if eliciting or sharing stakeholder perspectives is important. Exploring these practical constraints provides opportunities for re-examining and refining the model purpose for stakeholders. The second step in the model selection process is about taking the requirements and constraints we've identified in the first step and turning them into criteria that we will use to evaluate alternate modelling methods. These criteria will be specific to the project and problem and they should be ranked and prioritised in this step. For example, from the end user perspective, some government departments may have a statutory requirement to use a particular established model for, say, the hydrological component of the system. Having such a requirement will immediately limit modelling options to a coupled component type of approach. If the modelling is intended to have a strong social learning and participatory aspect with stakeholders involved in the model development, then having a modelling type that is intuitive and simple to conceptualise and parameterise may be a priority. The criteria for reliability will depend on the problem being modelled. If the problem is related to, for instance, land use planning, there will be a strong need for a spatial scale representation. If the ecological aspects of the system are poorly understood, then there may be a much higher tolerance for the model to have large uncertainties. In terms of the criteria ranking, the priorities should be based on need or importance. For example, in a hypothetical case in which fishery management is the focus, the most important criteria were that the selective approach supports co-design of models with stakeholders, is relatively easy for them to understand, copes with limited quantitative data and can meet a three month project deadline and more. The third step in the selection process involves evaluating a set of integrated modelling approaches against the list of criteria established. Very often modellers have a set of approaches, sometimes only one or two, that they are familiar with. In fact, it is very common that a modelling approach is selected based on the modeller's expertise and experience, rather than what is the best approach for the given problem and end user. This may represent a feasibility constraint Given the funds or time restrictions, the modeler may only be able to represent the given problem in a modeling paradigm they are familiar with 
and able to set up and apply. Learning a new modelling approach will take more resources and there may be risks in developing or interpreting a new type of model incorrectly. On the other hand, selecting an approach based on feasibility only may lead to missed opportunities in having a model that better suits the end user needs or that better represents the problem. This may prove to be critical in determining whether or not a model is adopted by the end user or achieves its intended outcomes. These are the types of trade-offs that need to be carefully considered when selecting a modelling approach. In terms of assessing approaches against the criteria, this could be done like a checklist where yes or no is given for each criterion. We may be considering Bayesian networks, fuzzy cognitive mapping and systems dynamics as potential approaches. If these three approaches are evaluated against the criteria, we may consider fuzzy cognitive mapping the most appropriate as it meets those needs. Because of the complex nature of integrated assessment issues and the fact that there are degrees of capability, it may be useful to devise a scale, say from zero to five, for scoring the criteria. The selected modeling approach is then based on the extent to which it meets those chosen criteria. This could also be a more subjective judgment based on a comparison of the evaluations, or there may be attempts to make this more objective by making the selection based on the overall score. As you can tell by now, each modeling approach has a different set of features that affects how it is able to capture a system and its processes and the resources required to develop the model. Some approaches such as Bayesian networks and fuzzy cognitive mapping are well suited for conceptualising and developing models with stakeholders, and they are also apt for developing modelling where there is limited empirical data. Approaches such as coupled component models, systems dynamics and agent-based models can describe more complex interactions, but need more sophisticated understanding of system interactions, more modelling skills and more time to develop. As I mentioned earlier, it is natural to interpret a given system to a model that you are familiar with. However, we encourage consideration of approaches that are more suitable to the problem and context at hand. This is especially the case given current technological advances, growing computational power, developments in both new and existing approaches, newly demonstrated applications, as well as the fact that new types of data are becoming available, such as those from sensors and social media. We are proposing a more systematic approach to model selection in which the model is explicit about what they want to achieve through the modeling and what they need and want the model to include. Any one socio-environmental problem can potentially be represented by several different integrated modeling approaches. The ultimate selection will be bound by subjective, social and technical factors and the choice between different approaches is likely to involve some sort of trade-off between the various selection criteria. For modelling to be a more trusted tool in the science or policy discourse, there needs to be more transparency in the model development process, including in the selection of the modelling approach, which is critical to how the problem is represented and what outcomes the modelling can achieve. While subjectivity cannot be avoided in the model selection process, we encourage that the justification and assumptions of the choice are documented. This serves for both scientific credibility as well as support for future developments in addressing socio-environmental problems. So, to bring together what I have covered, while socio-environmental problems transcend disciplines and sectors, integrated modelling helps bridge these and provides a tool for understanding and exploring problems and their potential solutions. Selecting the best modelling approach is essential, a systematic process that considers the requirements and constraints specific to the problem allows researchers and stakeholders to make the kind of progress they hope to achieve. Thank you for listening. Please now enjoy comments by our panel of experts on model selection.